This episode of Top to Bottom is sponsored by Noted Analytics. Are you tired of losing sales opportunities to the status quo? Not seeing meaningful information in Serum to help close deals? Empower your team with Noted Analytics, the first guided selling for CRM platform that uses sales methodologies like gap selling, medic, and others to revolutionize the way revenue teams capture, evaluate, and measure sales process effectiveness. Start increasing win rates, shortening sales cycles, and growing average sales prices today. Check it out at notedanalytics.com. And we're live. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Sales Top to Bottom with me, Keenan, your host, and the lovely Beck. Beck, how has Paris been? Have you met a boy? It's been wonderful. I met lots of boys. <laughs> what do you mean? It's the city of love. When you, no, when you say hello, you meet a boy, technically. It's the city of love. Have you met a boy? <laughs> Paris. <laughs> it's the city of love. Springtime in Paris. I mean, I mean, it's handmade. I will say that the the Ooh. French. I, shock. I, I, I was just shock. Uh, shock. Okay. Uh, no. So I will say that uh, the French culture has like fifteen words for boyfriend or girlfriend. Fifteen. Like in the U.S. It's like you know. Boyfriend, girlfriend, that's it. Very no. Boyfriend, girlfriend, talking to each other, seeing each other, going out, steady. Nah, man, we got we got steady. a lot. Steady. That's the 40s. <laughs> like, look at this. I, I, I didn't say it was new, but you know, talking to they have, like, that's, 15, like, they have like 15 words. So they call they call the men in, in Paris smoothies because they, they know how to talk. <laughs> at your uh, average bystander. They do know how they do know how to. You know, but I don't speak French, so. You call me Jamba Juice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that, we are going on to the first segment of this podcast. Wait a minute, Just- hold on. Before you do the segment, oh, don't do What's it. Up? Okay, everybody, listen. We know we missed last week. We apologize. We do. We apologize. I- Beck was celebrating her, her, her Paris leaving trip. She was having a go-away party. She was drunk and... She doesn't drink, but I can still say that. She was she was drunk on life, partying, et cetera. So she didn't make it. So I want everybody here who's who's listening right now, I want you to drop a tag a name of somebody that should be listening to this podcast right now. Drop it in and tell them to pay attention. I'll, give you, a I'll give you as a gift for missing last week the best line that I've heard. Best line that I've heard. What's this best line? <laughs> Someone said uh, in French, et Juliette et le soleil which means, and Juliet is the sun. And I'm walking by and then I understood, I'm like, wow. Yeah. Yes. Juliet is the sun that faces the rising moon. I know, but to say that as a quick line, I was like, damn, France. Yeah, the mere fact that I could continue it though, don't I get any credit for that? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> the amount of guys in America who's probably read Romeo and Juliet is probably... I know. And it was like, just like a passing yeah. line. And I was like, dang, that's effective. Just from a line perspective, I was like, wow. So they know their poetry. <laughs> well, anyways, we are now going on to the first segment of this podcast, which is... Email Teardown on yon window breaks all right well this is the segment where keenan and beck tear down emails and messages that were sent over to them and so on to the first email this one uh the subject line is hold up the subject line is 10 percent of the cost of traditional staffing fees beck and this is a small ad so i apologize in advance but robot is pioneering passive talents servicing the other 75 percent of the workforce who don't apply let us help you woo your ideal candidates and schedule the first interview and this is under the heading hiring passive talent just got easier best blank whatever her name is and then a huge photo of her 
Uh, Beck, what are your thoughts on this one? My first thoughts, if I was candid, is I think we've done this one. Yeah, I, I think, think we have two. I think this is an old one. Oh, this yeah. is an old one. I'm sorry. I wasn't here for the last podcast that y'all were in. So uh, let's go on to the next one. Let's see if the next one is still up. If not, I'll just bring up uh, a separate email. We all the make pressure. the same. The pressure this now. Me. Is this the same one? Okay. I'm Yes, it is. Well, let's see. Well, how about how about let me let me pull up an email and uh, I don't me... even know if that. Wait, is that is that we did? I can't read it. Have we done that one back to the other one? Yeah, we have. Oh man, uh, we're off to a slow start today. I know. Well, I know. Gonna I, get angry. Oh wait, 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 wait. Uh, I think it's in podcast agenda twenty eight, man. 28. <laughs> we're going way back. It's an archive. Oh, we're going way back. There is, there is one time where I uh my computer shorted and I pushed Keenan on stage and basically just told him to tell jokes in, in time. And he did, which was nice. So Keenan, you have a that. joke? Oh, uh, get us your best joke in the meantime, Keenan. I'll give you a joke too. I can't. I don't have any clean jokes anymore. I only get unclean jokes. Uh <laughs> Did you know that? Here's my joke. And men, you can find it. I think it's 28. There, it's two emails to me. Did you know that if you clean a vacuum cleaner, <laughs> you become a vacuum cleaner? That's awful. If you clean, I, just, if you I clean don't know what you said. You become a vacuum cleaner. Oh, my god. Pretty goodness. good. No, that's like, you know, the whole park on a driveway and drive on a parkway and that all that. Oh, Beck, humor. All right. What is brown and in the woods? Don King asks us. What's brown? <laughs> okay, so everyone, we're like tanking here. Like our yes. first. Okay, wow. here's the first email that I was able to. Oh, what's brown and in the woods? Yes, yes. I'm not taking the bait, Don King, but Doug King, but tell us what's brown and in the woods, baby. <laughs> Okay. He'll come. Men, yes. Men Win, Winnie's, Winnie's poo. Winnie's poo. <laughs> Winnie's poo. <laughs> okay. Anyways, I found I found a message that was sent over to Beck, okay. and I'm sorry I don't have the the nice visual with it, but please forgive me. It says, uh, "Hi Beck. Hope all is well. I wanted to give you an update. I'm now doing sales consulting for growing SaaS firms in two main areas. One." Helping sales teams drive outbound pipe generation, increases leads and booked meetings. Two, coaching AEs on how to win their active enterprise deals, increase win rates, and APR, ARR slash deal. I implement and teach methods my teams have used to win many enterprise accounts. Would this be helpful to you? Beck, what do you think about this message over? I think that she's a competitor. And she's trying to email, trying to sell me on her competitive services. That's all I have to That's say. All. <laughs> what about you, Keenan? What do you think about this uh, this message? I'll say to you, Keenan. I think she's right. I mean, if we want to go deeper, she doesn't understand who she's sending it to. I get this stuff all the time. People reach out to me all the time. They can help my sales team, help my sales this, help my sales that. I'm just like, I don't know what to say to you, dog. I mean, I'm not going to pay someone from the services that I provide myself. So I'm not quite sure what to help you. So I, I think the answer to this is people need to do a much, much better job at understanding who they're targeting and why they're targeting those people. Well, and, and if that means you go ahead, keep going. Sorry. Keep going. If that means you got to spend more time working your list and developing your list. So be it work and develop your list. But I just don't think people think about who they send them to. Uh, so the other thing was she mentioned that she works with SaaS companies and I'm like, so even from a list cleaning perspective, if you were to hybrid a list off of LinkedIn, I'm listed as a think tank, you know? So mm. I'm like, I'm not a SaaS company. You're and a think tank. I'm a think wow. tank. Are there any fish in that tank? Uh, no. Okay. So, you know, we, yeah, no. What? So what, what, without having to find another one, um, I actually do have another one if y'all are ready. Oh, go. It. Let's roll, man. All right, let's roll. Let's roll. This one is also to Beck, and it says, Hi, Beck. Did you know that skills 
not just a degree or pedigree, are becoming more important to identify qualified talent, with more than 45% of hires on LinkedIn explicitly using skills data to fill their roles, you can be sure that the candidates you receive through LinkedIn jobs are the right fit for your needs. Um, are you interested in working through uh, how you can create a job posting on LinkedIn? Keenan, what are your did thoughts LinkedIn, on this? Message? Did LinkedIn send that? No, this is a, uh, okay. from what I no, get, no, it's, it's someone no, who good. consults. That's fine. All right, that's fine. So, so here's the first thing, right? I, I don't understand why Beck keeps getting all these recruiting <laughs> recruiting emails. I don't understand. Like, Beck, if I'm you, I'd want to go out in the real world and see what's going on because too many people send you recruiting emails. That's one that I don't get. Number two, this person doesn't address any type of problem. And like the other ones I should have said, but I didn't, there's no – they're all too focused on what they think they can deliver. You know, like it's all about, I can get you this. And this one, it's a skills one. I can get you good candidates by using skill based something or other. Well, why in the world would Beck need skill based something other in the first place? So if you want a recruiting email to be a good recruiting email, it's probably needs to say something like, are you losing um, placements because your candidates can't compete with the competition. So if, if you're a recruiting company, if you're an internal, are you losing candidates to the competition? Are you finding candidates, you hire candidates that end up leaving within 12 months because they weren't the right hire, right? Like start with some real problems that they could be having from a recruiting perspective, then explain to me that the reason I could be losing it is because it's not skills-based or explain to me the reason I could be losing is because I didn't understand the qualifications better, blah, blah, blah. And then say how you solve that problem. But if you can't start with a problem, I, I it's just a waste of my time or anybody's time. Uh, what about you, Beck? What do you think about this uh, message? Well, I, I mean, to Keenan's point, I'm not hiring. I haven't been for a, like, I haven't ever been. Um, what I don't understand from the trigger perspective is if you were to go to my LinkedIn, it actually says that I have five employees, like random people that tag that they work at Flip the Script. And so I send them very sweet messages being like, take this shit down, basically. <laughs> like, I was like, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> One guy was like, I'm really sorry. I work for a bakery called Flip the Script and I just got confused. I was like, never mind. Just keep me here. <laughs> All right, continue. All right. Boy, but technically, I said I was spotless in Paris. Technically, I still am. Because <laughs> you're in San Francisco now. Oh, you know what? <laughs> technicality but i'll i'll, I'll take it i'll take it let it pass <laughs> I've, i'm getting a lot of emails cold emails in french now Ooh la la. <laughs> from the trigger they're like oh space in paris mm, très bien très bien and they're they're prospecting emails about outbound prospecting meetings in french i'm like ah uh. They're like, oh, she just moved here two months ago. She surely, she must be fluent. <laughs> well, anyways, we're on to the next segment of this podcast, which is sales mythology. This is the segment where Beck and Keenan demystify common myths in the sales industry. So the first myth of today is... The worst thing that happens to a buyer when you don't run good discovery is they get bored or irritated. Beck, what are your thoughts on this sales myth? Yeah. Um, while I'll agree that that is something that can happen to them, the worst thing that happens to your buyer in a not good discovery is that you don't uncover that they've misdiagnosed something or that they've missed a diagnosis you know, entirely. So discovery is meant to discover uh, what a true diagnosis is, you know? And I saw this actually in a clip. <laughs> I take it hard on the influencers because I should, honestly. It's our job, ethically, to, to lead people in the right direction. I saw someone say, yeah, if you ask bad questions in a discovery, the worst thing, or uh, what can happen is they get bored, or worst case scenario, they get irritated. And I'm like, I'm left with, I'm like, maybe on the emotional side for sure, but like your discovery process should be truly to help your buyer and it should be to correct your buyer and to not making 
mistakes that they would have made and run into problems they would have run into if they didn't know the information that you had uncovered and that you presented to them, you know, in the next meeting. So I think this shows me is the litmus test, like from the high level, that most sellers, most influencers, da, 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 are still to this day, not after helping your buyer at all. It's just helping them to close more effectively is the only thing that we're after in the room. <clears throat> it's kind of a downer. Keenan, what do you think? Yeah, no. Um, I think the worst thing that's a myth, I mean, I think it's a, it's a thing and it happens and it's not good, but I think the worst thing is um, that they buy the wrong product yeah. or they don't buy the right product. So they don't do anything and they should have done something or they do something and they shouldn't have done something or they bought the wrong product. Um, they did, they did something they should have, but they bought the wrong product or solution. That's really the biggest problem. And, and Beck, you're going to be so excited. So excited, Beck. Like so, so excited oh, wow. with, what I'm, with what I'm about to drop. Well, I don't know about drop because I got to figure out what I do with it. But what I'm doing right now, and it's germane to this, to this question, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing a massive research project of buyers. I'm serving over a thousand buyers across all functional um, groups. And we got, a, we just got the first little taste of the results. So with, in chunks and you know, one of the more interesting things that jumped out at me, one of the questions we asked was, have you ever started the sales process without fully understanding and scoping the problem? 30% said yes. 30. There was, there are just under one third of all people start the buying process without understanding the problem. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then you, if you and the salesperson don't start to figure out the problem pretty fucking quick, Mm -hmm. You're going to buy the wrong thing or you're not going to make the right choice or the right decision. That's the worst thing that can happen, hands mm -hmm. down. All right. So the next myth of today data, is Beck, data. Data. <laughs> uh, the, the next myth of today is the longer I've been in sales, the more of an expert it means that I am at selling. Keenan, what do you think about this? What I think is don't ever confuse experience with expertise ever, ever. Do not confuse experience with expertise. The only thing time gets you is more time. You may learn a few more things, but in no way, shape, or form does it make you an expert. An expert comes from actually challenging things, processing things, paying attention, um, cataloging in your mind what worked and what didn't work, why it worked and why it didn't work, learning new things about the industry of space you're in that you didn't know, bringing new things to the space that you did that didn't exist beforehand, et cetera. No, no, no. Don't ever confuse experience with expertise. All right, what about you, Beck? What do you think? <laughs> yeah. You on to be an expert in anything, you have to spend 10,000 hours in it. Like that's, that's the race that you're after. Can y'all hear that siren? Oh yeah. <laughs> San Francisco is a great city. It's gone. It's gone. So the race is to 10,000 hours. And so I agree with Keenan, Keenan's point of like, you know, if you spend 20 years in something, clearly you have more hours available. But I see sellers in general, um, and I, I don't know how to feel about it at this point, um, but bereft of a hunger to learn and to learn about their buyer. Like there's a hunger in some cases to learn like the new objection handling technique or the new you know, cold calling thing and the new, you know, pattern interrupt or whatever. But I never see a true hunger for people to learn about their actual buyer. I very, very rarely come across it. So I think that there's an unbelievable expertise. Experience just means you have uh, like repetitively done something. So a lot of times it means you've repetitively done something incorrectly or ineffectively but it convinces, you know, sellers in their head. They're like, because I've done this so much, this is the most effective way to do it because they don't essentially, you know, know any better. But I think it actually issues, it issues in a lot of deleterious things of like an ego, you know, an understanding of something that it's hard to get them to pivot. But no, I don't think that they equal each other at all. And I wish, I really wish not to get, you know, whatever, biblical on everyone. I hope that I wake up tomorrow and people- I hope really you do too. 
I hope, hope I wake up tomorrow and, uh, and that people want to learn about their buyer. Yeah, good luck with that. Good luck with that. That they want good to luck. learn. You know, I can't tell you the amount of, I can't, not with the influencers. Influencers I've heard say like, oh, well, I don't read books. And I just fly by the seat of my pants. I'm like, that's not a trophy or an award or a brag. That's showing that you have no education on the topic that you're talking on. And what's worse is you don't give a shit. Like you give yep. a shit on whether you learn about this. So my my desire for the community is that people start to learn about their buyer so they can help their buyer. You know, so mm-hmm. we truly actually pivot into a position that's valuable is after their own good. So it's like, you know, do what you have to do. Go read books, Google things, Google KPIs that they're after, go to webinars that they attend, but just start to learn about your buyer. So you can help people in the room more effectively, you know, other than just being wasted space and pressure for them to close. Mm -hmm. All right. And the last sales myth of today is coaching and training are the same things. Mm -hmm. Beck, what are your thoughts on this one? They're not. uh, They get confused a lot uh, from my view. And then I'm interested to hear Keenan's take. I'm going to go five seconds on this. Uh, Training is teaching someone how to do something. Coaching is identifying where they're not being effective at it, telling them what they're doing and helping them change to do the most effective thing. So they can be done simultaneously, but usually training comes first and then the coaching comes in before the mess happens. Keenan, what do you think? No, you nailed it. Training is, is introducing new concepts, ideas that someone's unaware of. It's introducing them. It's explaining why those are important, the value they have in those, what steps you need to do them then the coaching is the, uh, the support you give them and ac- actually um, applying or executing on the new lesson, the new skill, the new whatever. So you train on a skill, then you coach on executing the skill. So training is introduction, coaching is execution. Yeah. How's that? It's great. It's good. Hey, since we have more time, how about a bonus uh, sales myth? Uh, sales myth number four. AEs, by and large, are experts at discovery. Keenan, what are your thoughts on this one? Oh, no, 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 no. I can't believe that came up with it. You guys, I feel, I feel set up because I have been pos- po- pondering a, um, a post, but I haven't been able to figure out how to write it yet because this is, this is the largest problem in sales today and nobody can accept it. Everybody thinks they're good sales, um, good to do, 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 oh. Everybody thinks they do good discovery. Management thinks they do good discovery. Everybody's running around talking about how great they are at discovery. Now people are starting to realize that the buyers don't think it's good discovery. So rather than blame the salesperson, they're blaming discovery fatigue and blaming the buyer for getting discovery fatigue. When it comes down to the simple fact that salespeople absolutely have no clue on how to do discovery. And I have watched countless, and I mean countless, discoveries via Gong, Chorus, Coach 360 from my clients, and I love them to death, and they're trying. They're better than everybody else, but people are terrible at it. Terrible. Terrible. Sorry, Beck, but I took your all your time. <laughs> you were set up. I was like, he'll like this one. <laughs> it's, guys, seriously, like, this, this, I honestly believe in my heart of hearts, and I'm still trying to figure out how to convey this to the sales world because they don't get it. It, they just don't get it that the reason sales conversion rates are as low as they are. And the reason we're not doing as well is twofold. One, the sales team is a horrible discovery. And two, there is no real clear in most organizations. There isn't gap selling clear definition of what a good quality opportunity looks like, which then transfers or translates into horrible deal management because the managers do not know how to assess a good deal. So when they don't know how to assess a good deal, deals move forward all the way to the end that shouldn't be there in the first place. They're, they're forecasted and they don't close and everybody's fucking surprised what the hell happened. That the whole process from discovery on is a shit show and nobody recognizes it. Nobody recognizes it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Dropping bombs here today. Uh, Okay, we are on to the next segment of this uh, podcast, which is... Take it or leave it. 
This is the segment where I introduce common sales tactics and Keenan and Beck let us know whether they would take it or leave it. So the first one of today is following up with prospects who downloaded content to book a meeting. Keenan, take it or leave it. Oh, take it all day long. Take it, take it, take it. it if you're smart, it's intent data, right? So if you built these things properly, then it should give you the intent of, uh, of what's going on in their world, right? I know that probably wasn't the right word, but yes, all day long, intent data. Yes, 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 yes. All right. What about you, Beck? Take it or leave it. Yeah, I'm going to take it. I think it comes down to execution. It's not executed properly, in my opinion. Most people will be like, follow up with right away and then ask them like, <clears throat> hey, do you have any questions about the content? They're like, no, I didn't even read it. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, okay. Well, yeah. bye. Yeah. The call ends. That's how the, you know, but I'm going to take it from a high level. But yes, I think the, the approach needs to be gutted. Yeah. And to Beck's point, because Beck did a brilliant job of calling out what not to do. What you do do is you you bring up the 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 intent behind the the content. So if someone downloads, I'm making this up. You know, ten reasons how to do better management. Then you you get them on the call. You follow up and say, hey, listen, I know she downloaded it. Are you guys struggling with certain challenges in management right now? Are you looking at ways to improve your management? Like you just lean in on the intent behind it and get them talking about that. It's kind of hard from that. Right. If I literally download an ebook, how to build dollhouses, unless I did it by accident, it's kind of hard for me to hide. It's like, yeah, either a friend wanted to do it. I'm looking to do it. My daughter wanted to do it. But there's something going on in my life. And I just showed it to you. So just lean right in on that. I uh, am the last take it or leave it for today is setting an agenda at the start of a discovery. Keenan, take it or leave it. Oh, man. <laughs> <sighs> oh, <laughs> ah. uh, okay. Oh, okay. For the average general population, I'm going to take it. Okay. Setting the <laughs> expectation with the buyer, you know, letting them know what you're going to show and why recapping what was in the discovery based on the discovery. We heard the following boom, boom, boom. So therefore the agenda is going to address these things boom 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 right so yes but the reason i'm i'm flibber and flabbering is i don't do it i do it on the fly right so i don't what does that say do as i say not as i do so <laughs> yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna take it okay beck what are your thoughts on this one take it or leave it yeah i'm definitely gonna take it you know i think it people are are two to three x more scared of something they don't know versus like they they're they're not sure about versus something that they do know about but is negative so i think that there's a lot of <clears throat> anxiety and ambiguity um so i would definitely set an agenda but i think if i had to guess why keenan's uneasy it's because most people see it as like a tactic or a technique to close people like that's mm -hmm. like their their <laughs> horse that they're like, their their cart to so I think definitely set an agenda to give them an overview of what's going to actually happen within the meeting just so they, you know, they feel safe, they feel comfortable, you know, you give them an outline. Um, but it should never be a technique, you know, essentially. It should just be a part of any meeting, in my opinion. Um, and I guess my follow-up question, since we're not, we have, we're all out of take it or leave it, so my follow-up yeah. question is what type of salespeople um, would going on the fly instead of setting agenda work? Um, obviously Keenan type salespeople, but what other, what specifically in those people make it so it's like, oh, you shouldn't do an agenda, but it's better for you to do it on the fly. I think it's just people who are really quick on their feet, right? They, they hold the information in their head well, and they, they know what's going to happen when they get on the call and they've, and they're attaching it to what they, um, to discovery and they have all of that knowledge in their head, then they can fly, but that's not everybody, you know? I mean, most people aren't that organized in their head. So, or can't recall information that well and can't work that well on the fly. So, you know, it's, you better safe than sorry. Here, here's another take it or leave it. Sending a list and a breakup, e and, of, uh, and a breakup email of why the buyer isn't responding and asking them to choose, Keenan, take it or leave it. <laughs> like you're either off on an island somewhere, you don't care about mm. data, you want me to leave you alone, take it or leave yeah, it. Yeah, no. Leave it. Leave it. 
I'm now, gonna, it, now you said a list. Now you said a list. Oh, we're gonna get buzzed. Yeah, you're gonna get buzzed. <laughs> but Keenan, go go on, carry. On. <laughs> Keep going. You set a list. I would use a gap selling list. So hey, I haven't heard from you back. However, I'm confused. You said in our discovery that you're losing this much money. The impact to customers is this. You're concerned you're not going to get your next tranche of funding. Blah blah blah. You said the reason all this was going on was because of boom, 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 boom. I'm confused, or surprised, or concerned. I haven't heard from you. Understanding that the timeline was such. Have you solved the problem? Have you gone another route? And if so, no problem. But if not, I'd love to get this back on track. So, you know, so the following doesn't whatever the closing is. Mm -hmm. That's a list. <clears throat> there we go. Well, with that, we are going on to the next segment of this podcast, my personal favorite segment of this podcast, which is the inbox. The inbox. <laughs> this is the segment where Keenan and Beck answer questions from our audience. And after a, a, a way too long hiatus, we have our very welcome special guest the trusty mailbox <laughs> and let's see what type of messages come out of this one i the first one is from uh shahriar sultan uh no location any suggestions on the best way to start a cold call back why don't you start us on this one i i'd say two things that i usually well i'm gonna say three things and then kick to keenan the first one is, I start with a question, hey, is Beck calling on your quarter line with flip the script, have you been? And how they respond, you should take that into account. Like if they say like, where'd you get my number? Don't sprint through it. <laughs> like they're mad, you know, don't be like zoom info, the reason for my outreach is, and that's what I hear up to And I'm like, Brendan, you're cooked. Like you have to stop there. So my first tip is uh, to start with a question. Second tip is to go into personalization. Give them a blip of personalization. Prove to them that you know who they are. So it gains credibility right off the bat. You know, I was on your LinkedIn earlier. I saw this article that you wrote. Love this line where you said, blah, blah, blah. So I was curious to know if you've come across Flip the Script before. That's usually my opener. So I don't do permi uh, permission-based openers. I use personalization kind of as a pattern interrupt, you know, to, to kind of uh, gain that uh, credibility. But those are my first three steps right off the bat is ask them how they've been. If they give you an emotional response, you have to react accordingly. You know, but if they just say like, good, I'm good. I'd be like, good. Glad to hear that. Reason why I reach is and go into a personalization bit and ask them if they, they've come across your company before. That's usually my opener. What about you, Keenan? What are, what are your thoughts on this one? I'm a big fan of permission based. Big fan. So, hey, this is Keenan with ASG. I know I'm interrupting you. Can I get... 30 seconds to tell you why I called, right? I love that because if they say no, I can either extend or truth of the matter is they almost never say no. Truth of the matter is in that first piece, they almost never say no. And if they do to her point where they're mad, just let them go. You're not wasting time. But when they do say yes, now they are completely disarmed. They've, they've given you permission to come in. And so what you do after this is the most important piece. I like to lead with problems. Right. So you say, as I said, I'm with ASG. We help people who are struggling with long sales cycles, poor forecasting, the salespeople negotiating poorly. I'm making them all up. Right. Because um, I, I will interweave these. It's important. I'll interweave these based on what I think are most people responding to. Um, losing to the status quo, um, you know, deals uh, that you thought you were going to win, you lose for no reason, et cetera. I'll put three or four of those in. Um, and we work with them who are struggling with those problems, blah, blah, blah. Are you experiencing any of those problems? And if so, I'd love 30 minutes in the next week or two to walk through how we help people solve those. So now they're, they're faced with, do I say yes, I'm having those problems, or do I say no? And if I am having those problems and I say no, too many people can't do that in their head because they're like, maybe he really could help me. So if I say no, I'm an idiot because it would be nice to fix. And if he does say yes, then I just have to make them feel comfortable that I can address them and I can't do a whole, uh, what you want. Now, what happens a lot of times is they say, well, tell me now. And then what I'll say is like, I, I, can, I can tell you what we do and I give a two-second thing and I say, however, what's really important is I'd want to understand which of those problems are you having and can we talk more about that? And that's what I'd like to do because I know I just interrupted you. If you have the 30 minutes or 15 minutes, I'll take it now, but, right? And you, and you almost defer, so I'm not trying to push you. Like there's more here than just selling you stuff and they get disarmed again. So that's how I do it. 
All right, the next question of today, and this one's a little bit of a long one, so uh, please. You only have a minute, me. man. Hundred percent. I'll be, I'll cut it short. I've been in AE for four years and still feel nervous and uncomfortable during discovery and d- demo meetings. I talk to a lot of older male executives as buyers, which to a woman like me can be very intimidating. How can I keep the nerves down, put my best foot forward, and nail those meetings? Keenan, what are your thoughts on this one? Should have given it to Beck. She's a woman. Yeah. Beck. All right, giving okay. it straight to Beck. Uh, outlearn them. <clears throat> if you learn more than them, they'll increase your confidence. You know, so if I know a lot more than the average rep, the confidence grows with that. So my my biggest tip would be to learn as much about your craft as you absolutely can and to relinquish the chains of trying to manipulate someone and ask questions to diagnose. I will say that people people say uh, they ask me a lot. They're like, uh, uh, "You seem really confident on stage," <clears throat> and I'm like, "Well, I'm an introvert. I don't love like if you look at me classically as a speaker. I actually like if there were ten pillars of good speaking, I probably miss all ten of them. But it's the material that I'm like, whatever material I'm presenting, I like am at that point." <laughs> You know, I spent a lot of time and so the confidence immediately, you know, I noticed that in the beginning when I first started speaking, it'd be like 30 seconds and I was nervous. But then I'm like, oh, it's just explaining this concept. And then everything was fine after that. So I just outlearn them, outlearn everyone. All right. And with that, we are on to the next segment of this podcast, which is the challenge. This is the segment where Keenan and Beck break down a challenging subject within the sales industry. And the challenge for today is how to overcome imposter syndrome as an AE or SDR. Keenan, why don't you start us off with this one? I have no fucking idea. Like literally, I, I have no idea how you would overcome imposter syndrome. Now, I'm sure there's something out there. Now I want to go read it. So I'm pretty sure Beck's going to give us a nice long dissertation because she's read about this. But by my, my understanding and definition of imposter syndrome is, is the fact that you're, you think you're an imposter and, and, and you don't think as good as you really are. Sort of the opposite of a Dunning-Kruger, right? Well, in spite of how much you know, you have imposter syndrome. So my natural inclination will learn more. Well, that's not going to solve it because I may be the smartest guy in the world. And I still have imposter syndrome. So that is way above my pay grade. I would have no idea how to address that. I, here, watch this. I'm putting my gap sign thinking brain on. All I keep thinking is, well, what causes it? That's all I keep thinking right now, right now, what causes it, what causes it, what causes it. So now I'm going into, is it childhood issues? Is it, you know, I think mine comes from, because I have massive imposter syndrome, massive. I think mine comes from my high school teachers and the adults in my life when I was younger continually telling me I'm a fuck up and I'm an idiot and blah, blah, blah. So, but I, I don't know. It may have nothing to do with that, right? So I have no idea what causes it. So if I don't know what causes it, I can't tell you guys how to solve it. So Beck, take it away. I'm ready to learn. Well, I have a, I have a question then I'll, I'll take it from there. But when you're teaching skiing to others, like, you know, when they're just starting, do you feel like an imposter then? No. No. Why not? <clears throat> Why not? Um, well, twofold, twofold, because, and I don't feel like an imposter when I train gap selling either. Mm-hmm. So, so the concept of training someone who's in front of me and I can assess their capabilities and I literally just skied up to them and I can look around the mountain and I could go all day and maybe see nobody that skis as well as me or one person. Like I have the, the constant reinforcement that I know what I'm doing and I'm good. For me, imposter syndrome comes in when I think about the book or I think about the size of the company I built or the fact we just crossed 100,000 books sold or I have universities calling me and asking me to if they can use gap selling in their trains. Like, I didn't write that book. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the, like, obviously I wrote it, but in my head it's like, how did I write a book that's this popular? I'm not that smart. I'm not that good. You know what I'm saying? That's where it comes in. Um. My biggest tip, and there's a lot of stuff out there. It's weird that it's it kind of into the last question, but there's a lot of stuff out there where people will be like, oh, just be more confident. Everyone's an imposter around you and everyone feels that way. And I'm like, 
that's, I don't wish that upon them. Like, I don't like that they're also feeling that too. Yeah. Um, the biggest way to fight it in my, it's going to be really bad, but I've been spicy the whole podcast. I'm sick. Is to become what helps me is to become less of an imposter. Become learn, what? Become less of a, less of an imposter. Like learn about your actual craft. So to your point, the reason you don't feel like an imposter when you're skiing is you're like, I can out ski these guys like 15 fold, 20 fold, 25 fold. So you don't have to go to any like lectures or webinars on how to not feel like an imposter. Cause you're like, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm stronger than these people around me. So I think that they can, they could, could learn something from me and you're correct. And like when you're talking about gap selling, it's like same thing. So I believe, I believe that ugh, this is going to be bad, but I'm just going to say it. I believe that imposter syndrome and a lot of facets is your body's way of telling you that you feel like you don't know enough. And I think that that can be a good thing in a lot of pretenses, like meaning it can drive of like, okay, I want to feel like less than an imposter. So I'm like, if you have one hour and you could go to a workshop on how to have more self-confidence, or you could have, take that hour to like learn about the subject material of whatever it is. And it's like, I would take my hour and learn, learn about the subject material or whatever it is, just so I felt more confident in the room. That's how I overcome it. You know? Okay. I mean, so I think at a micro level, I can get behind that. Right. But at a macro level, I, again, I'm going to keep saying this. I don't understand what causes it. So at a macro level, I, cause I envision imposter syndrome at a macro level. So I envision, um, um, uh, Imposter syndrome is, let's say, um, someone gets elected president, okay? You got elected president. You passed all the policies in the past, et cetera. But they're like, how did I get here? Like, seriously? Like, I, I'm not, I, 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 like, I'm not president material. Like, yeah, I'm smart and I know shit and I've done good things. But this is a whole new level, right? Like, this whole idea. Or a guy or girl who starts a company. And after 25 years, that company is like a Patagonia making shit up. And the person said, like, how did this happen? Like, I, I'm i not this good. And I'm sitting on top of a multi-billion. Like, you can't learn yourself into not that. Like, that's a different layer. You can't learn yourself into that. Well, in the, in the instance, I think it's a really, really interesting discussion. But in the instance of, like, Patagonia, let's say you become a CEO and, like, you had the one hit. I think that that imposter syndrome is valid. They haven't been a CEO before. They don't know what it's like to be a CEO. No, they built it. They didn't become the CEO. They built it from scratch. And they're like, how did I get it? That's the imposter. Oh, going. I don't see that usually. I see someone, they like become a CEO and the thing takes off and they're like, I'm not a real CEO. And I'm like, well, that's correct. You haven't really built companies before. So in that, instead of my biggest push is instead of freaking out, to just take that and channel it towards CEO lessons, like figure out what are the principles of EBITDA? Like, how could I like look after gr growth in my market or market share, like, et cetera. Like what are the basic foundations and principles and KPIs that I should be after looking at, like looking at what is the stage, you know, A company, B company, C company, post funding, blah, blah, blah. So I think in a lot of cases it's helped me because it shined a light been like you don't feel like you know enough in this area you know but if you're in the regard that you're bringing it up of like you built something and then you're like oh i don't feel like i did this yeah that, like i do with my book all that, the time <laughs> all the time mm -hmm. that one i think is psychological that one's a different different warfare but in a lot of cases but it's still part of because what they greg christensen imposter syndrome simply put is doubt it creeps in and shows up regardless of your knowledge expertise and confidence so he's arguing that it has nothing to do with what you know and it's a sense of doubt so you know what we should do we should both go research this and see what causes it because we're both swinging from the vines right now i mean well i from imposter syndrome i can only tell you how i overcame it because i did have imposter syndrome for a very long time and what changed for me was, this is going to sound bad, but I'm like, I'm not a speaker. I'm not a public speaker. I'm not someone that people should listen to until this is going to sound really bad. But I saw someone else speak and I'm like, I know more than them. <laughs> and they're just fine. They're not drowning on stage. They're totally fine. Everyone's high-fiving them. So I'm like, I took that as a lot of confidence. And then I just 
learn 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 some different things i don't know that's how i okay so this is good this is good so so a couple people said some things so leslie uh oh don't be mad at me leslie um shaman uh shamion shamion i don't know i o n shamion shamion sorry leslie leslie says isn't that humility brendan shu says do you believe imposter syndrome can be alleviated by changing your role within the conversation to a learner role than an expertise Obviously, there is context to this. And then Matt Fogarty said, I think you can address imposter syndrome by looking inward. I think it comes from insecurity. So I think there's a crossover from a lot of that. You know, and as I was processing this conversation, you know, I think mine, and I, boy, I think mine probably is a lot more psychological. Mine comes from the idea that people are accepting what I'm putting out, right? So the idea that I wrote this book and 100,000 people have bought it and, and people all over the world are, are, you know, saying great things about it. I thought I had smart ideas, I knew I knew a lot about sales, but I didn't ever think when I wrote that book that it would be this powerful and have this much impact in this world of sales, right? And so I, I, it's how we look at ourselves compared to other people. In some areas, this is going to sound stupid and pretty lack of humility, but from an athletic perspective, I never became a world-class athlete, but I never had insecurity and posture about my ability to be athletic, even for my age, right? Mm -hmm. But I never saw myself as an academic, Never saw myself as an academic. So to start getting all these awards and in, 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 in recognition for being an academic, whoa, hey, that's I'm 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 I could write a book, but I can't write a book that's gonna be a bestseller, right? I can help like so I think it could be a lot of how we view ourselves mm -hmm. and then how that translates into how the world perceives us. And if they don't align, that could create imposter syndrome. All right, five seconds early. But He looked like he's with his buddies. Hold on, boys. I got one. Oh, yeah. Ah. Don't, don't you worry. I will not be putting that horn on with a second left. I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we end this podcast, we have just one more thing. Oh, listen, just one more thing. All right, perfect. This is the last segment of our podcast where Beck and Keenan share with us what's on their minds and give us their closing thoughts. So first, let's start with Keenan. What is your just one more thing? It's going to be an extension of, of the trigger <laughs> that you triggered me early in today and that <clears throat> we need more humility in sales and sales leadership. We have, I'm going to pick 60s as the dawn of modern selling, okay? We could debate it, but I'm gonna go with the 60s, dawn of modern selling. And we have been pushing this, this rock down this road that has looked pretty similar and we've just sort of made a few changes on the outside and we've kind of just, and it's all been sort of the same. And, and now we're here and everybody still thinks it's germane, everybody thinks it's relevant and, and they're all interpreting things in the same manner that says, oh, you know, look, I just got to create these tweaks. Like I just saw someone come out the other day with a book on closing. Are you hot? We're still talking about closing. Closing should not be something you try to teach people. That that There's no closure should ever happen again. It's 2023. But people just aren't grasping it. They're just not grasping how poorly we sell. And they can't get out of their own way. And they're not, they're unwilling to set back and evaluate what are we doing here? What are our motives? What am I teaching these people? What is the underlying thesis or premise for what I'm teaching them? And it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. And, and, and I'm going to transition this to Beck, but I'd love her to answer my question. But I was thinking this the other day. <clears throat> if you ask me, what is the underlying premise or thesis for or the basis, whatever you want to call it, for the gap selling principles, I can give you one. It's really simple. It's that people do not buy anything unless their current state is untenable, intolerable, and that sales is all about change, influencing change. You cannot get someone to change if their current state is not intolerable or untenable, period. And therefore, it's a salesperson's job to influence that change. That is the thesis. Human, that's the basis of, of gap selling. Humans don't change until they have to, okay? Now, I challenge you, and that's what I'm gonna lead to you, Beck. What is the thesis to 
to uh, Medic. What's the thesis or under, underlying argument to the, the to Sandler or the underlying mental solution sign? Like, what is it? What is it? Because I've never heard it. So what we do is we just have these ideas on how to drive a transaction that have built on each other, like cities over, you know, 100 AD, 500 AD. And we just keep building on these cities and don't ever change anything. So it, it, we have to stop and take a look. We have to stop and take a look at what the fuck are we doing? Because it ain't working. It ain't working. But no one will do it. We don't have the humility to do it. All right. What about you, Beck? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so um, I might do an extension from from what he was saying, but uh, I watch a lot of Bill James. He's one of my favorite content creators. People who don't know him. He started the Society of American Baseball Research, later known as Sabermetrics. Billy Bean piggybacked off a lot of his work, uh, made movie Moneyball based on it. Um. But he's really insightful, really, really insightful. And one of the things uh, that he said in his one of his interviews once was that there is a point where um, ultimate humility and ultimate arrogance meet. That to to learn anything takes humility because it takes a recognition that you don't know something and then a desire to do something about that. So you can't have a desire to learn about something if you don't know that you don't know something. <clears throat> but once you put in all that time, 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 all that time to study, he said it meets with arrogance because you now say, and very rightfully so, I look at this problem that hundreds of thousands of other people are looking at the same problem across the world but I look at it differently. Yeah. But the reason that you do that is because you've done all of that studying and you've had all of that humility the entire time. So the thing that, even though we've talked about a lot on this podcast, the thing that's really on my heart is um, there needs to be a desire to learn in sales that I do not see a desire to learn to help your buyer. I see a lot of talk about having empathy and being kind and being compassionate and being human and all that shit. And I'm like, Hey, that's great. But if you really were kind, you would learn more about your buyer's world so you could actually help them and not miss sell something. And so actually now I just kind of think you're a big phony and I'm going to like mentally tune out. So I'm like, how you really are empathetic is you understand them to the definition, how you're really kind to someone is you possess a capability that can help them. And how you do all of that is by learning about their world. So I'm like, yeah, I'll close with this. Bill James also said, there's a bunch of people asking him basically why they didn't have new topics to talk about. And he was like, well, it's because you view the world in terms of things that you already know. He said, I view the world in terms of things that I don't know. Don't know. And that's a huge world. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. ultimately have all of these questions and thesis and things that I'm going to try and find out because that's how I view the world. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, I want to challenge people to look at the world of sales and look at the world of their buyers and ask yourself the devastatingly, like, you know, surfacing question of, how much do you believe at this point that you don't know about your buyer in your buyer's world? Their indicators, their metrics, their problems, their root causes. And if that amount is any amount over zero, then just start learning today about their world so that you can truly help them. That's my one last thing. <laughs> well, that's the podcast. That's it. Beautiful. Bill James is well all right, everybody. Thank you very much. Bill James is good. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Sales Top to Bottom podcast. I'm your host, Keenan. And I'm back. See you next week. <laughs>